Welcome to Talking Beats with Daniel Lelchuk. We hope you'll subscribe and give us a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Now, if you like the show, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash talking beats. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash talking beats. We believe now more than ever in providing a platform for individuality, free thought, and a diverse range of views. By supporting the show this way, you'll get early access to episodes, bonus episodes, and much, much more. Remember, the conversation is always active at Talking Beats Podcast on social media. Here's Daniel Lelchuk. On today's program, diplomat and writer Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, he was director of policy planning for the United States Department of State. Confirmed by the U.S. Senate to hold the rank of ambassador, Dr. Haas also served as U.S. coordinator for policy toward the future of Afghanistan and U.S. envoy to the Northern Ireland peace process. He's received the Presidential Citizens Medal and was also senior director for Near East and South Asian Affairs at the National Security Council. The author of 14 books, including Foreign Policy Begins at Home, The Case for Putting America's House in Order, War of Necessity, War of Choice, A Memoir of Two Iraq Wars, and A World in Disarray, American Foreign Policy and the Crisis of the Old Order. His most recent book takes a broad look at where we are right now and the crucial events that shape the world in which we live. The new book I'm referring to is The World a brief introduction about which Madeleine Albright said, quote, just what every citizen and student needs to read. I'm thrilled he's joining me right now, Richard Haas. Welcome to you, sir. Well, it's great to be here with you. In 2017, you published a book called The World in Disarray, American Foreign Policy and the Crisis of the Old Order. Here we are, Richard Haas, spring 2021, and I'm perusing the website of the Council on Foreign Relations, of which you're the president, the various articles paint a picture of a world in disarray. Where are we now as compared to 2017 when you wrote that? I'm really sorry to say that if I were to put out a new edition, I would have to find a way to say a world in greater disarray. It's it's not a world in anarchy. It's not a world in chaos. But if there were some kind of a measure, say there was a share of stock called How Good Is the World?, it would have lost Syria's value over the last, what, four or five years. <laughs> um, I, I, I was thinking how, how quaint uh, the word disarray seems in 2017 as compared to now. <laughs> it's funny at the time. I, uh, <laughs> as often my practice, I had several people read the book in draft, read the manuscript in draft. And several of the people, particularly those who were the most expert in foreign policy and international relations said, yeah, this is pretty good, Richard. But we've got to tell you, uh, we think uh, the word disarray is too strong. We think you're much too negative about where the world is and where it's heading. And I thought about it because I respect them and I took it seriously and, and I called them or wrote them back and said, well, I'm going to stick with it. I actually uh, have come to the conclusion that disarray is, is equally fair and accurate. And who'd have thunk that we'd be having this conversation now a few years later where it looks, if anything, quaint, too mild, the good old days, uh, such as history. <laughs> the good old days, in- indeed. And, and so, so it leads me into, into looking here at the, at the cover of your new book, The World, A Brief Introduction. And it seems that, that writing this book, I'm, I'm not pretending to be you, but my, my little theory is that you, you felt like you're throwing your arms in the air and what else can I do other than try to speak as simply and as coherently and cogently to as many people as possible about the past hundred years or so in our world and describe in little, I call them vignettes, a little essays, what the Cold War is, what is trade, what is cybersecurity? Is that what you're doing? Well, close. Uh, you know, the, a world in disarray was, was really an argument. It was an analysis of this is where the world is. This is why I've chosen the word disarray. This is why it's a matter of concern and so forth. Here are some things we might want to do. Uh, This next book, the one that you just mentioned, The World, A Brief Introduction, 
was not and is not an argument for the most part. It's really what, what we would call a primer. And for reasons I still don't understand, the, the British call a primer. And it's, it stems from the fact that one of the reasons I'd concluded that the world was in disarray was that American foreign policy was increasingly in disarray and incoherent and incons inconsistent. And that one of the reasons in turn that was the case was so many Americans didn't care about it. And so many Americans didn't understand the relationship either between what happened in the world and what was happening here inside the country and vice versa, didn't understand the impact of what America chose to do in the world on the world. And there's obviously a, a, a loop there in, in, in both directions. And it's, it's, it's odd. And then some to be having this conversation. Here we are living with and dying from a virus that came out of a mid-sized city in China just over a year ago. We're about up against the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. We see the effects of climate change every day. Our, our cyber systems are hacked from abroad uh, every day. But again, uh, for all sorts of reasons, from the fact that these, these issues are not taught in schools, or if they're offered in colleges, they're not required as a condition of graduation. They're rarely covered at all, at all or if they are covered, they're rarely covered seriously on television or, or radio. For any number of reasons, uh, America's, Americans had become increasingly distant uh, when it came to understanding, again, either the importance of foreign policy or importance of the world. And I decided I would do my modest or immodest best to help address that and fill that gap. How long do you think, maybe it's a silly question, but how long have Americans as a whole been uninterested in foreign policy? Actually, it's a great question. For most of our history, actually, it turns out. I mean, think about it. Uh, when one goes back to the roots of this country, you know, roughly two and a half centuries ago, the whole focus was on separating the United States from, from the Britain. We had our, our revolution. We went through an unsuccessful experiment with the Articles of Confederation. We then had the, the Constitution. The first president, Mr. Washington, in his farewell address, essentially talked about the, the danger of uh, entangling alliances. People like Jefferson were totally concerned with things here at home. Uh, John Quincy Adams wrote about not going abroad in search of monsters to destroy. And the first really you know, century and a half or more of American uh, life was focused on the continent. Again, for better and for worse, uh, civil war, uh, United States settling the, the continent uh, more than, you know, more, uh, quite often violently. But all the same, it was very much an inward looking, it was an inward looking country other than for trade. We had a slight experiment with colonialism at the end of the uh, 19th century, but it was just that it was, it was short lived. World War One, we entered late, we entered reluctantly, and as soon as it was over, we retreated back into into isolationism. It was only with Pearl Harbor and World War Two, and then with the Cold War, that the United States remained involved in the world uh, for for a prolonged period. And essentially, if you think about it, it was from roughly uh, you know, early 1940s until recently that foreign policy has been central. But, but even then, even then, when isolationism was rejected and you had a general degree of bipartisan support, still foreign policy was rarely the dominant issue in our public conversation. Sure, it was at the time, say, of Vietnam. But more often than not, if you look at American elections and you look at why people voted the way they did, you look at polls and you ask people, what do you care most about when you get up in the morning? It tends to be much more bread and butter issues about, about the economy uh, and the like. So, it, it, so the real question for me, and it's one I don't have the answer to yet, is what's, what's the norm and what's the exception? Is what we have gone through over the last 75 years or so, where we have been heavily involved in the world, is that the norm? And is late Obama and Trump and this mood of somewhat isolationist mood, is that the exception or vice versa? You know, was the 75 years the aberration? And now we're retreating to the American tradition of being suspicious about the world and sort of wanting to be left alone. 
You know, I think about civic education, the word civics, and something you mentioned in the book, and it's something that's come up a lot on this program. In October leading up to the election, I did a big panel with the Center for Strategic and International Studies all about civic education as a national security imperative. And uh, I hate how the word civics sound amazingly unsexy and amazingly un, sort of... A, a, <laughs> But really, I mean, unappealing to, I mean, e even if I, I think about the car, that's a Civic. It's not the most exciting thing. Um, <laughs> I, assume, I, there, I assume Honda is not a, a sponsor of your, of your, of your podcast. No, no, I, I, I had to turn them down. Um, uh, but, but, but no, I mean, is it, is there some other way to approach the getting people excited? I mean, the, the, let me just say from, from my own uh, experience, which is not the normal average American experience. I mean, I've been you know, lucky to travel all over the world my whole life, basically, playing concerts all over the place. I have friends in every country, practically, uh, speak various foreign languages. So sort of being interested in the world is just something that's naturally a part of me. But for someone who has none of that, uh, is there another word, another term, something else to pull them in and say, this is, this is why you should care? Uh, well, funny you should ask. Funny you should raise it. First of all, let me just sort of say, I think whatever we call it, whether it's civics or we can find something sexier, uh, I actually think that is the greatest national security threat facing the United States. I mean, sure, we've got to deal with China and Russia and North Korea and Iran and terrorism and climate change. I get it. It's what I worry about for a living. But my own view is the greatest threat right now to the national security of the United States uh, are the divisions within the body politic of the United States. Uh, to some extent, it came to a head on January 6th, but it existed before then, and it continues to uh, to exist to this day, and I fear far into the future. And the reason I say this is if we can somehow come together a degree, uh, I'm not a kumbaya type, but if we can have a, a basic level of, of political functionality, um, then the, 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 the question, you know, I believe then we will be able to contend with whatever external challenges we we face, uh, but I think that's that's an open question. Now, you know, whether we call it uh, civics or, or social studies or uh, studies in American democracy, I don't know. All I can tell you is my next book is on this topic. The book I've now started to write, in part for the reason I just gave you. I, I was listening to myself saying the biggest threat we face is our internal division, and then I said. Well, why not treat that as seriously as I would China or Russia or North Korea? And that's where I am. And somehow we've got to we've got to get it taught in schools. Uh, I don't think we I don't think we can or should take for granted that the DNA of American democracy is somehow automatically transmitted from generation to to generation. I think it has to be kind of active. The problem is, and it's almost uh, an oxymoron of sorts, that even if people were listening to the two of us and said, yeah, you two guys are right, civics or whatever you want to call it is really important, it's then almost impossible to get Americans to agree on what the content of civics should be. How do we tell our, our story? What is our story? What do we emphasize? What do we de-emphasize or leave out altogether? So one talks about it, but rather than it be something that, that is healing or bridging, so far, at least in many cases, it's become divisive. It seems to me that everything you're saying is absolutely right on the money. But with more and more Americans getting their news, in quotes, from social media, uh, and, and mm -hmm. certainly I think it's fair to say that our collective attention span and ability to read something longer than a hundred characters and listen to something longer than a soundbite uh, is, is only getting worse and worse. How does that get through uh, when we can't even say this is the Constitution, this is what it says without uh, huge arguments and fights ensuing? Uh, you put your finger on another part of the problem. We live in an era of what I, what I dub uh, narrow casting rather than broadcasting. I'm old enough, you know, I remember the days when we had three networks and we could argue whether it was, uh, you know, Huntley Brinkley or Savaroid or whoever it was, uh, on Walter Cronkite, what was, who was the best person to, to watch, but there was a, a sense of common experience. We did study social studies 
or some version of it in, in our in our schools. Uh, I don't have a good answer for you other than I think a couple of things. One is uh, we need more and more people in the society to begin to make the case uh, about this, uh, religious leaders. I just met the other day with hundreds of religious leaders. It's one of the things we do regularly at the Council of Foreign Relations. And I basically said they were voices of authority at a time that many Americans have, uh, are deeply disillusioned with the authority of secular leaders. And I said, I believe religious leaders need to step up to this. And they don't have to say, this, is, this ought to be your interpretation of the Second Amendment, or you ought to favor or oppose this piece of legislation. But they ought to talk about how we conduct ourselves in the public space. That is a totally legitimate and I would argue necessary thing for religious leaders to do. Increasingly, corporate leaders have to take this on. Corporations are not simply in the business of shareholder return. They are, they are functioning in a democratic society. They too have, a, I, I would argue, an obligation to, to step up. Private universities have a lot of freedom to do what they will do. So do charter schools and in some areas, uh, public schools. So I would, I would think that it may not be a national answer, answer from the federal government, which is divided, but I, c- I could imagine it coming more from various directions and beginning to gain some momentum. It's not a great answer to your question, but it's the only one so far I can come up with. Well, not at all. I, I think that there's no perfect solution. I, two things. One, you mentioned universities, and you talk about experience 10 years ago in Nantucket. You were off fishing, and you were chatting with the, mm-hmm. the son of your friend who had gone to Stanford, and, uh, and you were... Can you finish a story? What, 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 did, what did this little experience teach you, uh, other than the fact that, that there's pretty good fish off the coast of Nantucket? Well, and it does teach the difference between fishing and catching, which is an important <laughs> distinction, uh, in my case, at least. The, uh, you're, you're, no, you're, talking to someone who's, who's, you're talking to someone who's never been fishing in his life, so I, I, I'm gl- glad to know that. Well, the, the, the fish, thank you for it. Uh, <laughs> the, this was a young man, obviously smart, uh, going into a senior year at Stanford Computer Sciences. And I was just curious because my knowledge of computer science, shall we say, could fit in a thimble. And I said, to him, I'm just curious what else you study at Stanford, somebody with your interest, with your specialty. And I said, you know, what, kind of, what, what are you studying in history? And he, he said, basically, I don't take history courses. And I said, OK, well, what about economics? So well, I don't take those either. And we went through a lot of what we used to call the liberal arts curriculum. And it turned out that here was this bright young man a year away from graduating, was going to have a a truly incomplete education. Uh, It wasn't that these courses weren't offered. Of course they're offered. Stanford's one of the great institutions in the world, but most courses or virtually no courses now at American universities are required. What many universities have are so-called distribution requirements, but sometimes you can fulfill a certain requirement from a menu of maybe 50 or 100 courses. And again, coming back to the phrase we used before, talk about narrow casting. This is educational narrow, narrow casting. It means people don't leave the university with any sort of common experience, and it means they can be functionally illiterate, uh, either about American democracy or about the world that they are entering or both. And many people are. And it turns out Stanford's not unique. When I went back to my office in New York, uh, back when we used to work out of offices in places like cities, um, it turned out that this, this, this experience of this young man was much more typical than, than not. And that's in part what got me going to write this, this last book, The World, this primer, because, again, it was, it was my, my aim to put something forward that teachers, whether it was high schools or colleges or universities or just interested people of any age, uh, could turn to to get at least a a foundation. It wasn't going to necessarily prepare them to be secretary of state, but it would give them a foundation to fulfill Mr. Jefferson's notion of being an informed citizen. And I, and I'll be honest with you, Daniel, I had one other goal. Uh, My own view is that if people are more informed about the world, uh, they will be less likely to support policies that are isolationist. My own view is we ignore the world at our peril. If people understand the world, understand why it matters, connect, can connect some dots between what happens out there and the conditions of life here. My own view is that this country and the world will be better off for it. And again, that was my purpose. 
speaking about ignoring the world at our own peril, the virus COVID-19 is swirling uh, at a, a very scary pace all around India. And you've spoken recently about uh, our need, uh, our obligation, both for the people of India, but also in the future for us and for the Western world mm -hmm. uh, to get vaccines over there. What, what, are we, what, what do you see happening right now with regard to vaccines, the U.S. ability to get them over there and, uh, and what India needs? No, you're right. I have been speaking about this. This is uh, it's, it's actually a good case study. It's a good teaching moment. Uh, when you get on an airplane, if you remember the old days, again, when you got on an airplane, one of the first things you would hear was this uh, disembodied voice saying that in the event of a loss of cabin pressure, an oxygen mask will come down and fight your instincts. Instead, put it on yourself and only after you're stabilized, then turn to your neighbor and help others. It was sequential. And my whole argument in that, in the, the case of COVID-19 around the world is we need to reject that framing. And instead we need to think of thing, doing things simultaneously. And by that, I mean, we have to produce and distribute vaccines among ourselves here in the United States to as many of the 330 million Americans as we, as we can. But simultaneously, there are strong grounds for also producing and distributing vaccines around the world. First of all, it saves lives, there's a humanitarian reason. But second of all, out of simple self-interest, if we do not want variants to pop up, mutations to pop up in these other countries, Brazil, in India, it is in our self-interest to get them vaccines in large doses sooner rather than later. Also, just imagine if you're really concerned about uh, immigration pressures on the southern border of the United States. Well, guess what? One of the reasons people are leaving their countries is they can't get treatment or help for COVID-19. Plus, because of COVID-19, their economies are still shrinking. Ours is beginning to grow at a fast speed. So they are now heading towards the United States as a magnet. So for any number of reasons, and I could add strategic reasons of competing with China and Russia and so forth, I think there's a, a really powerful case that we ought to be uh, producing and exporting far, far, far more vaccine than we currently are. Are we sending any over now? And what do you think the reason is, if not, or why not a huge amount? What's, what is the, the thinking? Uh, the Biden administration announced, that, I think it was 20 million doses of uh, vaccine. We're going to be exported by the uh, end of June, but that, that's less than you know. That's less than a day's supply in the world. To, to be fair, there's certain shortages of some of the uh, precursors of raw materials. There's also questions about you know, companies are reluctant to allow the all the patents and formulas for making vaccines to be shared widely around the world. It takes time to build factories to do it. Some vaccines are more complicated than others to produce or transport, particularly those that require uh, very low temperatures. But we're sitting on you know, tens and tens of millions of AstraZeneca uh, vaccine that we're not using in this country. So uh, my own view is the administration is, you know, again, uh, I'm usually wary about ascribing motives, but I'll break my rule here. I think they are concerned about exporting vaccines lest they be charged with uh, not taking care of Americans first. It's one of the areas where, ironically enough, the foreign policy of this administration is not sufficiently different from the foreign policy of the uh, previous administration, in, in my view. Talk about what you see as the overarching uh, challenge in the next couple of months. You, you certainly... As you said before, you make your living worrying about various things around the world. <laughs> and you do you you run a pretty big place over there at the Council on Foreign Relations mm -hmm. where you're the president, the longtime president. Uh, and and you, you do write articles about sort of every region of the world. You're, you're all over the place. Where are you looking? I mean, obviously, India is in the news a lot right now. Israel is in the news sure. a lot right now. There, there are these sort of things, that especially if you follow social media, they're they're you know, every other meme is about the Israelis and the Palestinians, et cetera, et cetera. But what's under the surface? What are you looking at that we should be looking at? Uh, a couple of things. Uh, uh, one is the revival of great power competition. 
Uh, a lot of history can be understood through that lens. And right now we're seeing two very different versions of it with Russia and with China and their relations with the United States. And more than anything, I would say uh, the next 50 years will be determined a lot by the character of the relationship between the United States and an increasingly powerful and wealthy and active China. So that, that's one thing that I would say is truly basic that I spend a lot of my time trying to better understand. Uh, secondly, would be this, uh, this set of global issues, which we, we've been talking a lot about one of them, which is global disease, infectious disease. But, you know, again, there's climate change. There's the fact that cyber, the, the world of cyberspace is essentially unregulated. It's a, a kind of wild west, which is extraordinarily uh, uh, dangerous. You know, I, I could talk about trade. I could talk about proliferation. But what these, what these issues have in common is they're global. They don't respect borders. Uh, and there's an enormous gap and a dangerous gap between the scale of the challenge they pose and the robustness of the international response. So I spend a lot of time thinking about that. And then thirdly, and it actually circles back to what you and I were talking about a few moments ago, is I think a lot about us. And again, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I increasingly am thinking about the, the state of American democracy, the trajectory of our democracy as a national security issue, and asking myself, what is it that can be done to get it back uh, to get it back on track. So that, to me, you know, once we get past the daily headlines this week, the headlines have been the Middle East. Who knows what they'll be uh, next week or the week after? But I would say, great power rivalry, global issues, American democracy. If I were going to choose three things that I was pretty confident that if you and I were to have another conversation a year from now that would figure, I would say those three things. Let's talk about Europe for a moment. Uh, I was on a. <laughs> Sounds funny. I was on a German ship uh, with Joschka Fischer a couple of years ago in Asia. And um, Joschka Fischer, of course, the, the ex-vice chancellor of Germany. And I asked him, I said, uh, I said, when Angela Merkel leaves office in Germany, what leader there do you see as having the creativity, the spirit, the ambition, the balance, the respect to fill her shoes? And I said, I, I said, you know, my... Uh, non-professional opinion that I viewed Merkel as a, an amazing balancing force in Europe. At that time, she clearly was the balancing force. Uh, and, and he sort of, he said, well, don't worry, Germany, just by virtue of being Germany, by virtue of its economy and its reputation, will still be a, a leader no matter what. I, I remain skeptical of his response. Do you agree? Uh, I'm closer to you on this one than I am with Joshka. And he was actually a visiting fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and someone I respect. He, uh, he's a truly principled internationalist. And I, I admire that. He was uh, uncorrupted, if you will, by public, by public uh, office. No, I think what we've learned in Germany with the rise of the far right, with the uncertainty about leadership, the weakness years ago of the center-left party. Now we're seeing weaknesses of the center-right parties of Merkel. I think there's a, a, a degree of uncertainty, I'll, be, I'll use a generous diplomatic word, about Germany's uh, post-Merkel politics that we didn't anticipate. Most people a few years ago would have thought you'd have a relatively orchestrated succession. Somebody else from her party, from the center-right, would, would, would take over. Now we're looking at all sorts of coalitions. We're looking at groups on the far right that used to be outside parliament, uh, in parliament. And by the way, it's not just Germany. We're seeing you know, real questions about who could win the next presidential election in France. We're still living with the consequences of Brexit. We're actually at a time, I hope you're sitting down here, that what looks to be the most stable country in Europe right now, at least in terms of leadership, is Italy with Mario Draghi. <laughs> who is an extraordinarily smart, experienced, talented individual. But it's been a while, I bet, since you had anyone come on your podcast and say Italy right now looks to be to the, the model of, uh, of European stability. I'm, I'm glad you told me to, to, to hold on because, in, <laughs> in fact, I, I do all of these at, at, at a big stand-up desk, so I'm standing. But right when you said that, I grabbed on and held tight with both hands. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to be sure that I I wouldn't go down and bring this whole apparatus with me. Um, 
<laughs> so <good>. Mario, <laughs> Mario Draghi and, and Italy. Tell us why that's so weird. Other than, I mean, probably people are thinking of Berlusconi and sort of all that. But but why yeah. is Italy being <laughs> the most solid uh, in Europe right now? Bizarre. Well, for two reasons. Uh, one is that if one looks at the last 60, 70 years, basically post-World War II Italian history, I haven't done the, my homework on it, but I would, I would wager quite a few, uh, even a lot of Bitcoin, quite a few euros for sure, that Italy has had far more governments than any other country in Europe. You know, probably one on the average, uh, probably once a year, give or take. It was once described by a rather wry British historian and diplomat as a country of chronic stability, that prime ministers and coalitions would come and go and the country just continued. But a few years ago, Italy looked to be in really bad shape, tremendous splits between the South and the North, which obviously are, are still there, but it looked essentially ungovernable. And Mario Draghi, who has a distinguished career in finance, one of the leading voices and figures in European uh, finance, the European Central Bank and so forth, uh, became prime minister almost as a, I'm not sure what the equivalent would be in our country, but he not a politician. He's essentially a technocrat. And he was brought in. I think there was a sense of desperation for all the political and economic as well as public health challenges that Italy faced. And he is a talented person. And so far, at least, he is doing a, an impressive an impressive job. And it just it just stands out. And it's not something that had we had this conversation as recently as a year ago, uh, I would have uh, it would not have even have been on my radar think about sort of the I spent part of high school in Rome uh, living in Rome and uh, of course think about that that great city that that's considered the north by the south and the south by the north and it uh, s sits right at the middle uh, one of the most chaotic cities in the world that is until you go to Naples uh, and uh, certainly uh, you wonder how things work how things sort of happen day to day in Italy but they do somehow um, and they do somehow <laughs> <laughs> but I have to be careful here because uh, my wife's family uh, all comes from just south of Naples. So now I have to uh, you know, be be even more diplomatic than I than I normally uh, than I normally tend to uh, be. But you're, yes, uh, you're right. It, it, it does mostly work, and, except when it does. And <laughs> and um, more diplomatic than you usually are is saying a lot because it's sort of something that's uh, your milieu. I would say <laughs> it's diplomacy, but. Um, that aside, uh, by the way, the the food south of Naples and the and the the coffee and the mozzarella cheese and the pasta is all uh, pretty extraordinary. Yes, it's amazing that I am not obese because I am married to a good cook, and both of my children, both of our children, have picked it up. So homemade pasta is a is a regular feature of uh, life, and actually one of the nice things uh, of the pandemic. And I, I don't think we're alone in this. You, know, you end up spending more family time, obviously much more time physically at home. So cooking uh, uh, became a, a more central part of life, which uh, I was a tremendous beneficiary of, particularly since I did not do the cooking. Uh, I was basically in charge of the of the washing up afterwards, but I did benefit from the from the collective talent. <laughs> yes, a, a, absolutely. I, I certainly expanded my culinary pal over the past uh, twelve months or something. And uh, and another thing that uh, a lot of people had more time, or, or rather, they were forced into doing more, is experiencing music at home. And and you know, music is always a part of this sure. program, and it's it's sort of was actually the whole reason I started this because I think music is sort of the great unifier maybe the only great unifier in the world and i see it when i play beethoven 9 everywhere from here to shanghai to new zealand to oman and uh, the reaction is exactly the same from anybody who hears it what, what's music to you richard haas i have lots of answers that when i hear somebody mention beethoven's ninth i think of my son 20 years ago and i heard more renditions of on the cello of a Beto Ode to Joy, then uh, I can count. Uh, but uh, there you have it. Really? It's, so he's I, a cellist? He was. And unfortunately, uh, uh, he, he hasn't kept up with it, which is too bad. But he's, he's, he's working for one of the candidates for mayor. So he's kind of, he's kind of busy these days here in uh, New York. So I'll tell you, um, I'm glad you asked. I grew up in a house without much music. And my first encounter with music, and this is now, what, 60 years ago, is I was at an elementary school in a small town on Long Island called Valley Stream. 
And when I was in fifth grade, the, the sixth graders put on uh, an opera and they put on an opera, The Magic of Dysalber Flute. And they got the New York Times music critic, Harold Schoenberg, to come review it. Why, you may ask, would Harold Schoenberg, of all people, come review a sixth grade opera? <laughs> because, and, and I kid you not. You hope, here again, I hope you're holding on tight. <laughs> The name of our music teacher at Forest Road Elementary School was Jane Beethoven. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when Jane Beethoven called Harold, uh, Harold, he could not resist. And that was my first exposure to serious uh, music. And uh, I liked it, to say the least. And then when I, was, uh, I had trouble getting into college. If I bloomed, it was very late. And, but I ended up going to one of the great music schools in the world. I went to Oberlin and heard tremendous amounts of music. There. It was really my first exposure to classical music in a sustained way. And in the uh, spring of my freshman year, so this is now May of 1970, you may recall that's when the four kids were killed, the four students were killed at Kent State in the protest that followed the expansion of the Vietnam War into, uh, into Cambodia. They all came to Oberlin. There were all sorts of sit-ins and questions about how to how to protest. And what Oberlin decided to do was that uh, send its orchestra and chorus to Washington D.C. to sing Mozart's Requiem in the National Cathedral. And at the time, I was as a sideshow making movies, and I made a documentary about it. And I heard more rehearsals as well as obviously the final performance of, of Mozart's Requiem in the National Cathedral. And again, it was a, as a non-musician, it was the first time I'd heard something broken down and then put together and understood essentially how music, uh, symphonic music, or in this case, Requiem, how, how it was woven together. And it was just an extraordinary, for me, learning uh, experience. Oh, yeah, my other musical connections uh, in, the high, in the summer between high school and college this probably won't be as popular with you. Uh, I did go to Woodstock and uh, ha had that. Uh, I heard the Grateful Dead more times than most in my life and can never get enough of Uncle John's band or Ripple. Uh, during COVID, I've listened a lot to, uh, because he died, I've listened to a lot of John Prine's music. I've become a tremendous fan of the simplicity of John's music. And I'll tell you two other pieces I'll mention. One is if I had to choose one piece, I, I'm curious what you would think would be Saint-Saëns, his introduction in Rondo Capriccioso. If I, had to, if I had to hear one piece of music, for me, it's the single most exciting and dramatic piece of music I've ever heard. And every time I hear it, uh, I just get knocked out by it, just how, how exciting yeah. it is. And one last thing I'll mention is when I was... Uh, I was twice involved in Northern Ireland's politics. For three years, I was the United States envoy to the Northern Ireland peace talks at the beginning of uh, Bush 43. And then in, in 2013, I was asked back by the leaders of the parties of Northern Ireland to try to mediate their differences. They were having problems, and they, for some reason, agreed that I would be the one person that could perhaps help them resolve some of them. And it was an extraordinarily difficult, intense experience. And more than once, we were all kind of on the ledge. And my, at the time, uh, my team realized the only way to calm me down was to play a, a version of Somewhere Over the Rainbow <laughs> by, this, uh, by this rather large, beautiful singer uh, known, known as Israel Kamakawiya. Uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful rendition of it. And they would all start singing it when they sensed that my blood pressure was about to get into the danger zone. So uh, all of which is a really long-winded answer saying uh, I didn't grow up with music, but now it's, it, it's, you know, it's just a part, it's a daily part of life. No, it wasn't long-winded at all. And I uh, really did. I'm, I'm not kidding. I really did get goosebumps on my arm when you told the story about Oberlin rehearsing the Mozart Requiem and then going to DC to play it. I really just, I don't know. I, I I, I wish more of that happened. I, I wish I wish more of that happened. I, I think I mean obviously the past year prevented any of that, but I, I wish that more people would just say we're gonna do this and, and and do it and make a musical statement and of course Leonard Bernstein was one of the great inspiring figures mm -hmm. when it came to the power of music to at least 
pause people, maybe not to solve every problem, but also Rostropovich playing at the fall of the Berlin Wall, playing Bach. Who knows how much good it did, but probably changed a few people's lives. Oh, yeah, I think you're exactly right. Recently, I can't remember where I saw it. It was on Netflix or one of the channels. Uh, might have been even Chaiflex, which is this Israeli streaming service, but saw this entire story, I think it was Chaiflex, about um, an orchestra of uh, Israelis and Palestinians that was brought together by some Europeans. And the whole idea was just what you're saying, to, to bridge differences. Uh, and there was, again, it's just a reminder of how when art intersects with politics, it can have uh, it can have real power, both for those who are producing it and for those who are you know, hearing it or viewing it. Absolutely, I, one of my f- first experiences in the Middle East was playing with the Qatar Philharmonic, which is made up mostly of Europeans, but they have a few mm-hmm. Arabs in the orchestra. And one of the cellists there is a former cellist of the Alexandria Opera House, and uh, here I am, an American Jew, you know, sitting next to him, uh, and we're playing cello, playing the same part. We're playing Mozart because. We're there to serve the music, and uh, my well, background and his background had nothing to do with it at all. Our passion for the music and our need to serve Mozart was the reason we were there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I totally get it. The other thing, since you mentioned Judaism, uh, I'm also Jewish. You know, over the last what 15 months, my involvement with services is obviously virtual, and I, I belong to the synagogue in, in New York City, Park Avenue. And all the services are, are streamed. And we're lucky enough to have three sensational cantors. And so we've made it a family thing here on Friday nights. Whenever we're around uh, in the city, we, I would go to services. It's a great way to bookend the week. I'm a great believer in you know the whole idea of the Sabbath. At least take a little bit of time off to kind of just get off the merry-go-round. And for me, the, the Friday night service, which is very much uh, musically dominated, is just a, a wonderful, wonderful way to essentially wind down from the week and, and make a transition. It's, uh, again, I just feel uh, incredibly fortunate. And it is nothing better than to sit around the kitchen or the living room you know, with, with my family and, uh, and hear it on a Friday night. It, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a really good special moment. I love that, and I know the Park Avenue Synagogue. It's a beautiful space, and I've actually performed uh, very closely with Ozzy Schwartz, who's one of the cantors there. There you go. Who you probably know who has a... <laughs> Ozzy is uh, world-class. Beautiful voice. Absolutely, absolutely beautiful voice. Um, I wish we could talk about music all day or talk about pleasant things all day, but but that's not what you get paid to do. Um, <laughs> you, you have this whole swath of, of material coming at you every day and you write about in the book how do we sort through all of this and and i think a good way of sorting through and i don't mean to to be uh, commercialistic here but is this book uh, that i'm holding the world a brief introduction that that is sort of a, a good primer a sorting primer but but when you sit down at your computer and you you know scroll through your ipad or your phone and you're getting texts and emails and calls what do you see at this sort of 36,000, 40,000 foot view when you zoom out a little bit and you put your passions aside, but you have your worries? It's a really interesting question. I go back to my time as a student at Oxford when uh, this is roughly, what, 40 plus years ago. I was there in the 70s. And I spent an enormous amount of time uh, before I wrote my thesis uh, studying diplomatic history and studying the last few hundred years of history. And when I get up in the morning now and I, I look at what's going on, I feel, I feel we are living in history. I feel that once again, there are tectonic plates that are moving. And I contrast this with the cold war where you woke up in the morning and it was as if, uh, you had walked away from the chess table the night before and none of the pieces had moved. And it was, black and white, two set, two players. It was a fairly predictable world. I get up every morning now, and uh, I, uh, I feel just the opposite. I'm not quite sure who the players are, how many boards they're playing on, what moves have been made during the, uh, the, the night. So I think back of earlier periods of history. Some days it's more between the two world wars. 
more often than not, it's earlier than that, before the worst world, before the first world war, or even earlier, where I fear that I feel there's all these different players and fault lines and forces. And that's my sense that this is one of those moments in history where there's an enormous amount going on, uh, more dynamics than we can, than we can count. And we as yet do not know how they will be resolved. What will be the next plateau? What will be not a permanent endpoint, but at least a, a stabilizing period. And it's been 30 years essentially since we had that with the Cold War. Then you had a short era of American dominance, American primacy, but now, now that's giving way. And what I'm trying to understand with China in particular, with all these global issues, with doubts in this country about whether we have the appetite to play a role in the world, what does all this lead to? What, where are we going to be in a couple of years or in a decade? So that that's the way I approach the news, that I feel there's a, a range of possibility, a range of outcomes that is truly large, and many of which are not particularly attractive. And that's the stuff of history. A lot of what we've experienced for much of our lives, for all the problems, has been pretty good. Think about it, Daniel. Over the last 75 years, there hasn't been a great power conflict. The average person's lifespan is 10, 20, 30 years longer. The amount of wealth in the world is increased by orders of, of uh, magnitude. You had all these places that were formerly colonies became independent countries. Many of them became democratic. This has been an extraordinary run of history. It doesn't get much better than this. Indeed, I can't think of a better era. And now when I get up in the morning, I worry and I wonder, has that ended and where are we now? Are we returning almost the opposite? Instead of that, of that book called The End of History, are we living in the return of history? And that's what I feel. Well, it's not the most optimistic, I would say, but I, I, I think people should, should read the, the, the part four of this book, which is Order and Disorder. And uh, it's, the book's in four parts, and this is the last part, and there's different sections, and they're, they're all quite short, so they're quite readable. And, and the different sections in this order and disorder part, war between countries, international society, alliances and coalitions. And I think if people read this last segment, they would at least have a better feel of, of not what we're going through uh, in terms of a comforting sense, but I think they'd have a better feel in terms of the, quite the opposite, how unusual it is. And I, I remember even before the pandemic broke out, I was in south america playing some concerts and i said to a colleague i, I we were talking about general politics and I, I said there's sort of a nervousness in all parts of the world and and that was before the pandemic and now it's a million times worse i think yeah, i wish i could you know, stand here and disagree with you but uh i can't I, I often remark to people that if you're not worried you're not paying attention and so people should be worried. You know, it's, if you remember from high school science, uh, I didn't pay a lot of attention to high school science. Uh, but what little I did remember besides tectonic plates was the idea that the natural order of things is not order, that the whole idea of entropy, that things tend to come apart unless forces are brought to bear on them to introduce structure. And that's what I think history is about. And for the last 75 years, we have been the principal external force introducing structure and order into the scheme of things. But if we're no longer willing or no longer able to do that, well, 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 what then? You know, and a slightly more hopeful note, what I would say is, you know, in the course of my career, I've been lucky enough to work for four presidents. I've worked for uh, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, both Presidents Bush. And I've been up close enough to them and particularly for President Bush, the father, who I was closest to of the four. And I've seen the difference that individuals can make. There, there's very little about history that's inevitable. There's very little that's baked into the cake. So there's no reason to be, I mean, there's reasons to be concerned, but that's not the same as feeling that bad things uh, are inevitable, to be defeatist, to be uh, overly pessimistic. But one thing, my, my whole goal is to get people involved. Uh, again, Good things can happen, but only if essentially good people make them happen. So this is, you know, I'm not, when I'm pessimistic, it's not a kind of a defeatism or an argument for a passivity or inevitability, but it's rather, a, it, but it's against somehow assuming 
you know, uh, as Pangloss would, that this is the best of all possible worlds and things will always work out for the best. Well, no, that's not the case. Things don't always work out for the best. And, and people have to increase by have to act to increase the odds that they do. Well, on that note, increasing the odds that they do, and I think conversations like this make little dents and little progressions in the right direction rather than uh, cable news sound bites. I, I think when people really listen uh, and really hear someone like you speak, I, I think it's, um, it's inspiring. And indeed, Richard Haas, I thank you very much, and I hope you'll come back. No, thank you. And uh, I love, uh, again, the whole idea of... Uh focusing on the intersection of, uh, of music and, and all else. Uh, I think if there were a little bit more of that balance, we might all be a little bit better off. So thank you for what you do. You've been listening to Talking Beats with Daniel Elchuk. The original theme music is by Ronald Barkham. The content coordinator is Nathaniel Mose and Doug Christian is executive producer. We invite you to subscribe and leave a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. You can support us at patreon.com slash talking beats. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash talking beats. And be sure to check us out on social media. We'll see you next time on Talking Beats with Daniel Elchuk.